to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together Head and Savior of your body, the Church, unite all the children of God in one spirit. Send us as faithful laborers into your harvest that all may be gathered into your family. Pour out your spirit and power on those who preach your word. Prevent division and useless conflict in the Church. Put far from your people all who deceive. Bring back all who have gone astray. Defeat the evil intentions of those who oppose and persecute your church and help them to turn from the error of their ways. Grant love and unity to all our congregations. Keep our bishops and ministers sound in doctrine and holy in life. May everyone who serves in the church be faithful not only in great matters but also in the smallest things. Grant that all of us may pattern our lives after your example, that we may be your holy people to our life's end. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Lord, supply the needs of your people. Bless our labor and make us diligent in our daily tasks. Do not let any of us become entangled by the affairs of this life, but may everything we do or think be for you. Help us to make proper use of your gifts and make us generous in our giving. Help us to be loving and caring in all our relationships. Be present in our homes and guide us to bring up our children to love and serve you. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Direct all governments in the way of justice and peace that your will may be known and done among the nations. Bless those who hold office in our land and may we lead under them a peaceable, godly, and honest life. Deliver us from the sins which lead to war and conflict and strengthen within, within us the will to establish righteousness and justice on the earth. Enable us to make wise use of the world you have entrusted to us. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Good Shepherd, we commend to your care those of our congregation who are absent from us today. Watch over those who travel. Send help to all who are in danger, trouble, or anguish. Strengthen and support those who suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. Protect and provide for the poor, the hungry, and the homeless. Support the aged. Bless and heal the sick and the afflicted, and in their suffering, comfort them with your love. Enable the dying to put their trust in you as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Have mercy on your whole creation. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become your kingdom, and by grace make us worthy to stand before you. Keep us in everlasting fellowship with the church triumphant in heaven, and let us rest together in your presence from our labors. On this day, we remember those who have served in our armed forces.
Prince of Peace, even as we pray for an end to war, we give thanks for our soldiers' courage, for their love of country, and for their work to bring peace in our world. Healer of all, bind up the wounds of all who have served. Show us how to comfort those who are hurting. Merciful God, all suffer the cost of war. We remember widows and widowers, orphans, and all those separated, separated from those they love. We pray, gracious God, that swords will be turned into plowshares and that peace will reign. We give thanks for all who have served. Shield from danger those who bravely protect us. With them, may we glory not in war, but in your love and righteousness. Strengthen us to be your peacemakers in the world. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. And those of you who are present in here, I'd ask you to take a moment to look around and think of some sort of sign or gesture that you can pass along the peace of Christ. Now, if you're from the 60s, you may do a peace sign. Or, and those of you who are watching online, I would invite you to do the same in the, in the comments or over the phone. Good morning, everyone. Here is the news of the church for today, Sunday, November 8th. First, thank you all for the incredible response to our drive for the South Fork Thanksgiving feast. Starting tomorrow, the tiered rolling cart will be under the portico here at the Sanctuary End to receive the donations. So if you have signed up for something online, you may start bringing those from 10 until 4 every day, Monday through Friday, for the next two weeks. Thanks also to you, those of you who made cash donations for the purchase of turkey and ham and milk and cider. I think we've just about reached our goal there. And of course, should there be any money left, it will be designated for other South Fork outreach projects. We'll continue working with the school principal and staff there to identify those needs. And I have a feeling there may be a sneaker or coat drive in the future. Now, on behalf of the Congregational Life Committee, I would like for you to please place Sunday, December 6th on your calendars. Three important things are happening that afternoon, beginning at 4. Evie, what do you have at 4 o'clock? Well, first off, we're going to have an activity inside for families. It'll be socially distant, so everyone can take part. And one of the things you're going to have a chance to do is create your own nativity story in so stones. I know these are too small for you to see, but you'll be able to, um, everyone who comes can make a set so that you can retell the Christmas story with family and friends. Simultaneously, senior high youth will be stationed under the portico to receive your drive-through coin donations. I hope you've been collecting pennies and other coins for Samaritan. You know that Samaritan Ministries does really important work serving thousands of people in this community every year through shelter for homeless men and a hot meal every single day for men, women, and children. And so we really want to support Samaritan through our coins. And this year, it's going to be especially exciting because as you drive through and give your coins to the senior high youth, they will, will be pouring them into this gigantic Moravian candle. And you'll see a clear section here. You'll watch the coins build. And once it's full, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? <laughs> Something really great is going to happen. But we have a, ah, there it is. The, the flickering candle will, um, will be lit, and I think that's just going to be a real exciting moment. So thank you, Evie. Appreciate that. By the way, this candle has very authentically been created. This is real beeswax. And you'll see somewhere on the frill, there is a button representing the tack. So it's quite authentic. So um, I'll bet you can, you can guess who created that, Ms. Tiffany Henshaw. Thank you so much. Um, also on that afternoon, the band at 5 o'clock will begin to play. The Minor Prophets, our children's choir, will sing. Hot chocolate and packaged cookies will be available. And then at about 5.20, the Grand Marshal, that's the person who lights the tree, will be escorted out Thank you, Mr. Tim Reynolds, who will be driving the golf cart to take Ethel Butcher, who's this year's Grand Marshal. She will light the Christmas tree, and it's just going to be a, a wonderful celebration and plenty of room for lots of distancing. So I hope you and your families will, um, will come for that. So to recap, 4 o'clock, make a nativity, drive through your coins. 5 o'clock, bring your coins, and we'll still keep pouring them in until our candle is filled and lit and then the minor prophets singing, tree lighting, band playing, all between 5 and 5.30. Um, thanks from Jerry Tucker. He wants the congregation to know, especially those technicians and ushers who participated in the funeral service for his wife, Bonnie. Um, they helped make it a very important and special um, uh, service for his family. And Jerry, great to see you back with the guitar. 
Um, so a thank you from Jerry Tucker and his family. Now, before we go to prayer requests, we're going to move over to our mission moment. So on behalf of the missions committee, oh, thank you. Um, on behalf of the missions committee, we are going to today highlight Amani Ministries. Amani Children's Foundation was established several years ago and we have been supporting them for a number of years. You'll remember that they do really important work supporting um, homes in Kenya that take in abandoned babies, babies who've been abandoned because of, because of AIDS or HIV or who have been abandoned because of poverty. And of course, the COVID epidemic has only made that um, a more severe situation. And so you'll learn a little bit more about Amani, those of you at home and hopefully those of you right here, from Jane Stevens, who founded Amani with her husband, Chad, who's a physician here in Winston-Salem. So tech folks, take it away. Hi, I'm Jane Stevens, and I'm here to give you an update. Clive invited me to give you a report of New Life Home and the babies there that you all have supported so faithfully and, and so lovingly for 14 years now. I was in Kenya um, in February, so I got to see the homes right before COVID set in across the world. And we visited the poor homes, and every one of them was filled, uh, 170 babies. It was such a, a golden time uh, at the end of our trip. In fact, we were on our going to the airport the next day, and we got a call asking if we could come and receive one more baby. Of course, we implored the Nairobi home to let us get this last baby. And when we got there, there were three. So those three babies, I, I bring uh, them to you to, for special greetings today. But once COVID set in, it was times in Kenya got very difficult very fast. One, there was the virus, and then there was the hunger that set in as people were um, locked into their, their different neighborhoods. Uh, there was a suspicion that often comes with the virus in Kenya because the, the HIV virus left them so, so terrorized by what a virus could do. And there was the government um, really police brutality and in terms of enforcing those uh, the, the curfews and the things that they did. But, but all those measures worked and Kenya's had a very easy time of it um, relative to many of the European countries and to the US. But in those first months, it was the terror really that so impacted the people. And at New Life Home, they started early on stockpiling formula because it's imported and they knew it would get very expensive and just trying to keep their own baby safe. It's uh, working with unknown babies, babies of unknown origin, as they called it. It can be very stigmatized in Kenya. And at the time of COVID, it was particularly so. And in fact, if a nurse was known to work at a hospital uh, where there was COVID, Often her neighbors would uh, shun her and barricade her from coming home and harass her family. So New Life Home had to be very careful not to let their uh, workers be, not, be found to be working with children of unknown origins. And they, for the first few weeks, uh, simply laid low, took care of their kids, and then the most unimaginable thing happened in Kenya at a time when nobody even could travel uh, to another neighborhood. Uh, families started adopting again. I, I guess that's just like in America. COVID has made us realize how important family was. And these families who couldn't, who couldn't go to another town or stay up past seven, uh, nonetheless came to New Life Home to adopt. When that happened, what they noticed is they had free beds. Um, the unexpected thing was that they could take in new children, but they had no idea how. So they put their heads together and they came up with a, a plan that had to be done in, with great care and secrecy. So they asked for volunteers from the home and they would put together cohorts of anywhere from four to six uh, of the caregivers. And then as the hospitals called them, which they did daily to tell them about the babies in need, 
they would match them to a caregiver and they would secure them in a, 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 in a solitary place off and off campus and they would have a bed they would have a little chico burner for cooking and food and um, formula for the baby and they would be in that situation for 14 days without any visits from anybody without being able to visit their own children at home and without knowing what the, what the needs of that baby would be often they would be quite sick but after 14 days of the first Nairobi um, cohort when they brought them out uh, and test them test cost a hundred dollars so they didn't test lightly they were all negative and after that the other homes started having their their what they call it was sealing the sealing the babies into the ark and they would um, organize this this one-to-one -one match and seal them into the room they would be in and then 14 days later there would be a marvelous celebration Kenya knows how to celebrate like nobody's business and when they welcome the babies if if they had been positive they would have had to do another 14 days of uh, being sequestered so when these women signed up for this they signed up for a possible 28 days of isolation with the child they didn't know not knowing what was happening back home and yet they did it because that's what they do and they rescue babies um, I've always known that the, the women at, at New Life Home are the most loving I know and incredibly courageous but this summer I saw that courage at a whole new level and had they um, done what I thought they should do simply lay low and wait for COVID to pass there would be 40 babies uh, who would have actually passed instead and now those children are growing up uh, they'll being adopted some of them have already been matched and they will be cared for by loving families until they grow up and they have their own families and they join churches and businesses and become the next generation of our world thank you for being a part of it clearly this is work that is really inspiring and um, it's wonderful that our church does support Amani, you'll remember probably last year that we had a couple of events to raise funds for Amani, and in fact, um, through an event here at church as well as one outside, we raised over $3,300, which covered the cost of caring for more than three children for an entire year. We're going to have a chance to do something similar this year as one of our 12 days of service. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. And now for our prayer requests. Continuing prayers for Betty and Bill King. Catherine Teague, who had an injury at home um, with a fall, but is fine and she is recovering, and also Lisa Saunders. The last prayer request is for someone who will remain unnamed, but um, on Wednesday of this week, a church member popped in to tell me that she wanted to tell me a story. It was a story of her adult daughter, who was a mother herself, who had just the day before donated a kidney to a young man um, from across the country, someone she did not know, something that she had prayed about for a long time. Needless to say, um, a story of that importance um, came at just the right time to help us understand the priorities of this life. And her mother quoted her daughter's selfless act by talking about Proverbs 31 and the 20th verse, which says that she stretches out her hand to the poor, she reaches forth her hands with compassion. And so today we ask for your prayers for her complete recovery. Thank you. Let's join in prayer. Dear God, today we remember especially all those who fought and died for our freedom and to promote an enduring peace. I've heard and understand that there are more than 17 million veterans and we, we, we pray for them and for their, for their families. We pray for the people of Central America suffering the devastation of Hurricane Ada 
And we lift up to you the, the names that have been brought forth of people from our own congregation in different situations and needing your presence in a special way. We pray for our nation that you would bring healing and unity. We thank you that we have the light of your son, Jesus Christ, and help us to reflect his light in all that we do. Amen. Just a reminder that you can continue to support the ministries of New Philadelphia Moravian Church and to help Jesus shine in this community and in the world by sending your offerings um, by mail to New Philadelphia Moravian at 4440 Country Club Road, 27104, or by visiting our um, secure giving portals on the website. Let's pray. Receive our gifts and our lives, let them move at the impulse of your love. Amen.
First scripture reading today comes from the prophet Amos in the fifth chapter. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, and the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words.
and our gospel reading today from Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Good morning and welcome to the children's time and you adults can listen in too. So imagine that we are going camping and we hear that there's a storm coming, possible wind damage and flash flooding. There could be lots of water, but there's not gonna be food ahead. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, what do you do? Well, a scout's motto is be prepared. So. I brought rope and a flashlight, water purifiers, a first aid kit, a hatchet, fire starter, energy bars, but whew, that's a lot of stuff we're gonna have to carry. And you have to know what to do with each one of them, each item, to know how to be prepared. In the gospel reading this morning, Jesus is teaching using a parable again. Remember, a parable is a story that teaches a lesson. In this story, 10 bridesmaids were waiting for the bridegroom to arrive so that they could go in to the wedding and the party could start. They all had lanterns because it was nighttime. Some came prepared with extra oil, but some didn't. And they didn't know when that bridegroom was gonna arrive, how long it was gonna take. When he finally got there, it was the middle of the night. And the girls who had been prepared with the extra oil, well, they were ready when he came and they went into the party. But the ones who weren't prepared, well, they had to run around, waste time, trying to get oil for their lamps and they missed the party. Jesus was telling this story to teach his listeners that someday he was gonna come back. He was gonna come back for them and that at any time they needed to be ready because they wouldn't know just when he was coming. And just like that bridegroom in the parable, it was gonna be a surprise. So the moral of the story that Jesus told was, I'm gonna come back someday because I love you. So be ready so that whenever I do come back, you're prepared. Okay, awesome, be prepared. Wait, what does that mean? How do we prepare? Am I supposed to carry around oil for my lantern, survival gear, energy bars? What does it mean to be prepared for when Jesus comes back? Well, luckily, being ready for Jesus' return doesn't involve rope and flashlights and lanterns and water purifiers and all that mess. But if it's not all of that, what does it mean? Being prepared for Jesus means we need to ask him into our hearts. We need to ask for and receive his forgiveness. We need to have an active relationship with Jesus, making him part of our lives every day, and then we're good. That's it. Ask him into our hearts, ask and receive forgiveness, and have an active relationship, bringing him into our lives every day. That's easy. We can do that, and we can be ready. We can't rely on someone else's preparation, just like those bridesmaids in the story. 
that had to run around looking for oil from somebody else, they got left out. They needed to be prepared on their own. We need to be prepared, each one of us, so that we don't get left out. So let's be ready. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we want to follow your teachings. We invite you into our hearts. We ask you for your forgiveness for the times when we mess up. Please walk beside us this week and always. We love you. Amen. Watching and waiting and wondering and trying to stay awake. Now you might think that I'm summarizing the past few days as we watched political analyses that went on and on and, and waited for some sort of result or clarity or resolution and wondered what the outcome would be and what it would mean and tried to stay awake so as not to miss any new developments or announcements, but those kept being delayed. So yes, there certainly has been a lot of watching and waiting and wondering and keeping awake over the past few days. But for me personally, that scenario was almost sidelined by another scenario that was at the forefront of my thoughts this past week. I was watching and waiting and wondering and trying to stay awake as I tried to keep up with another path, not the path to 270 electoral votes, but rather the path that Hurricane Ada was taking in Central America. I watched the news and waited for a phone call or some sort of message from Lorena and then waited and, and wondered and tried to stay awake and the phone signal on the coast of Honduras was lost for about 18 hours and I didn't know if I could deal with this delay but finally the message came and I was able to focus my thoughts on the scripture readings for today. And what did I find there but more watching and waiting and wondering and staying awake. And I have to say that I struggled a bit with these passages, especially the reading in, in Matthew, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. The story is pretty simple, though we have to know a little bit about marriage customs in first century Palestine to, to really have it make sense. William Barclay is always a good source for that. And he gives us information and says that weddings were great occasions and that the whole village often turned out to accompany the couple to their new home. But before all of that could happen, the betrothal would have to take place. That was kind of like an engagement, but really somewhere in between being engaged and being married. The betrothed couple was technically married, but they still lived apart while they settled financial matters and, and lots of other details that had to be arranged. I guess we'd say prenuptial agreements. And when everything was ready, the bridegroom would come with a procession to be joined with his bride, and he would send a messenger ahead to announce his arrival. 
And then all of the guests would accompany the couple into their new home, and that's where the feasting, the banquet, the party would begin, and it could last for as much as a week. Well, in our parable, there were ten bridesmaids who were waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. And it says that five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now, that sounds a bit harsh, but as the parable unfolds, we see that they were foolish because they were unprepared. They, like the wise bridesmaids, bridesmaids, did have lamps. These would have been oil lamps that burned olive oil. But these five foolish bridesmaids didn't bring any oil. Some translations say they didn't bring any extra oil. But just, some just say they didn't bring any oil. They didn't have oil for the lamp to keep burning. They had the container, the vessel, the superficial external part, but not the fuel that would allow it to serve its purpose and keep going. Kind of like those festivals and offerings and assemblies that the prophet Amos refers to. Great on the outside, but empty, nothing inside. Now the word for foolish in Greek is moros, from which we get our word moronic. But it really means lacking a grip on reality. So the wise ones were wise because they understood that in reality, the bridegroom might be delayed. It might be a long night of watching and waiting and wondering and, and trying to stay awake, but the foolish ones weren't prepared for that reality. Well, all of them, the, the wise ones and the foolish ones, fell asleep. So just to be clear, so far the only difference in the wise ones and the foolish ones is that the wise ones have extra oil because they all fell asleep. And at midnight there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all of the bridesmaids woke up and got their lamps ready. The foolish bridesmaids saw that their lamps were, were flickering and, and were about to go out. So they asked the wise bridesmaids to give them some oil. Sounds like a reasonable request. But the wise bridesmaids said, no, there won't be enough for you and for us. You better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Ouch. That's the part that, that really bothered me. Is Jesus saying that, that if we're wise, we don't share what we have with others? Well, later in this same chapter, Jesus tells another parable, and we'll see that one in a couple of weeks, where he says that the way that we treat others is the way we treat him. And if we give to others, we are giving to him. So there must be something else going on here. This isn't about lack of generosity or about selfishness. Now you see, Jesus' Jewish audience thought of oil as an image or a symbol of God's presence. And we can give people a lot of things. We can give them assistance so that they can keep the lights on in their, in their homes. And when we do that, it's like we're doing that for, for Jesus himself, and that's a wonderful thing. But we can't give them our relationship with God. We can tell them about our experience of God and encourage them to call out to God and give their lives to God, but nothing that we can give or that they can buy can take the place of God's presence in their lives and in ours. Well, the foolish bridesmaids had a dilemma, and unfortunately, they followed the advice of the wise bridesmaids and went to try to buy oil for their lamps. Now, that was what seemed like a wise decision from a human perspective. But they missed the party. Because when they got back, it was too late. Now, I have to wonder, and I hope I'm not totally off base here. Just, just bear with me. I, I have to wonder, what if? What if when those bridesmaids heard that the bridegroom was coming, and saw that their lamps were flickering and about to burn out, what if, instead of going off to find their own solution, their own oil, what if they would have just stayed and waited for the bridegroom? Might this parable have had a different ending? I mean, if we're really talking about waiting for Jesus, and that's what this is about, and, and Jesus is the light of the world, the one true light, wouldn't it be better to, to wait in the darkness for the light to appear and let that light illuminate our lamps and our lives and let the oil of God's Spirit fill us instead of seeking human solutions and missing the party? Does, does that make sense? 
That means recognizing that God's presence in our lives is the only thing that can keep us going. And that nothing that anyone can give us or that we can buy can take the place of that. We can offer the flickering flames of our lives to Jesus, no matter how thin our light, no matter how dark the night, and let his light shine through us. Well, Jesus ends the parable by saying, keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And in some translations it says, keep alert. And in others it says, keep watch, or just watch. Be prepared, be ready. Well, I've shared several stories with, with you all about growing up in, in Nicaragua, and I remember going to, to Sunday school and learning songs and Bible verses in, in Miskito and English. Well, we learned one song, a chorus in English, and it was, Say, Will You Be Ready When Jesus Comes? And, and, and frankly, that kind of scared me. It made me a little nervous. Will, will I be ready when Jesus comes? And I remember thinking, I, I hope there's a squeaky gate between heaven and earth. Now, let me explain. You see, we lived in what was then a, a peaceful and very safe little village in Nicaragua. And sometimes in the evening, our, our parents would have meetings at the church or at the Bible Institute or at the Moravian Hospital, and we would be home alone. Our house had a fence around it, and there was a gate, and it had rusty, squeaky hinges but that was a good thing because we never knew exactly what time our parents would be getting back but no matter what we were doing or not doing when we would hear the squeaky gate we knew that we had about 15 seconds to stop doing that and start doing what we would want our parents to find us doing keep watch be prepared, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Well, in our case, we did know the day, or the, or the night anyway, but not the hour. But thankfully, we had a squeaky gate. Well, my Sunday school teacher also used to ask us, what would you want Jesus to find you doing when he comes back? And we would come up with all kinds of answers that involved us doing amazing things for God and for humanity. And then she would say, well, start doing that right now and you will be ready when Jesus comes. Well, I mentioned earlier that I struggled a little in, in preparing this sermon. There, there was a lot going on, a lot of unknowns. I didn't know how bad things might get in, in Central America with the hurricane. I, I, I didn't know what the political climate would be like later in the week. What I did know was that in Central America, there would be some people who would be relieved and others who would be devastated. And closer to home, here in the USA, there would be some people who would be pleased and others who would be concerned. So my message today is short and simple and straight to the point. And that is that God's word speaks to all of these situations, but God's word is not changed by any of these situations. God's presence sustains us, fuels us in all of these situations, but God's presence is not changed by any of these situations. Because the oil of God's presence in our lives comes from God. It comes from the one who is the light of the world and from no one else and from nowhere else. So our prayer today and every day is, make your church, dear Savior, a lamp of burnished gold to bear before the nations your true light as of old. O oh, teach your traveling pilgrims by this their path to trace, till clouds and darkness ended, we see you face to face. Amen.
We continue the custom of raising a hand, asking God's blessing on this congregation. I, I raise my other hand today with three purposes in mind. One, again, to ask God's blessing on, on veterans and their families, to ask God's blessing on people suffering from the hurricane in Central America, and to ask God's blessing on our nation. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore, in Jesus' name. Amen.